the 49ers insider for NBC Sports Bay Area, will have better answers than I do. Matt Mayoko, who is uh, in his 26th year covering the 49ers. Matt, thanks for joining us. Why are they playing this game tonight? Well, because it's the NFL, and the NFL can do whatever the heck it wants, and they, they want to play football on a Thursday night. Hey, uh, Dan, some late-breaking news here. Uh, my colleague at NBC Sports Bay Area, Jennifer Lee Chan, reports that there were no positive test results from the 49ers, and even the player who tested positive yesterday, Kendrick Bourne, tested negative. So mm. uh, the, those players won't be available to play in tonight's game, had it been a Sunday game, they would be able to play, but that might give you a little indication there too, is that, you know, they don't at least at this point believe that there's some outbreak going on with the 49ers. Uh, have they been able to practice? They had a uh, practice win, uh Tuesday night. And then after the building was cleared last night, they had a very brief walkthrough. So it's, it's a Thursday game. And so generally teams don't do a whole lot of practicing, uh, before a Thursday game, but uh, they did their meetings on Zoom yesterday and then a very brief get together for a walkthrough last night. We see this with teams that go to the Super Bowl, lose the Super Bowl. There's a Super Bowl hangover. But how do you explain what's happened to the Niners this year? I, I tell you what, you know, speaking from experience, I, I've never had a hangover or anything like what the 49ers are experiencing. <laughs> I mean, it, we're talking, and I don't know if you can put it on the the Super Bowl. I think there might have been a little bit of a mindset, you know, going into this season of, hey, let's just get back to the Super Bowl and win it this time, which isn't really, I don't think, the mindset you want. But when you're talking about you know, 12 players on injured reserve, and those are significant players. Two more will be going on, Jimmy Garoppolo and George Kittle. You have two players on the pup list, four players on the COVID-19 list. So when you look at the team that's suiting up tonight, theoretically suiting up tonight, compared to the team that played the Packers in the NFC Championship game, it bears no resemblance. So you can't necessarily expect, you know, a team without... Richard Sherman, without Nick Bosa, without uh, DeForest Buckner, who was traded away, without Garoppolo, Kittle, without their top three running backs. I mean, I could go on and on and on. You can't expect a team like that uh, compared to what the team looked like last year to just pick right up and steamroll through the NFC. So they're four and four right now, which puts them in the race. But I just don't know who they're going to, you know, they're going to be relying on Nick Mullins and Jamichael Hasty tonight and Ross Dwelly at tight end, a bunch of guys you've never heard of. Uh, so you definitely need a program tonight, e even if you're a Niners fan. Yes. At some point, I will be posting like a list on Twitter of numbers and players because, I mean, myself included, but uh, there will be a lot of fans tuning in who will have no idea who might be touching the ball. And another added element of this, not one player from that NFC Championship game who touched the ball for the 49ers on offense will be suiting up tonight. Other than and that... that Center, by the way, that includes the center. Oh. <laughs> when Garoppolo is good, is he great? Can he be great? I think when he's good, he's good. You know, and that's kind of the issue I think with him is. Is that good you know, enough, though, Matt? I, you know what? If you're talking about going forward for next season with a cap that's going down, with a salary expected to be, you know, he'll be 25 million next year. You know, I just I don't look at him right now as a player, as a quarterback who enables Kyle Shanahan to just say, oh, this is great. He, he does all the things I need him to do and more so we can put more on his plate. To, to me, it's kind of I mean, just look at the playoffs last year where you know he wasn't asked to throw. And in that AFC championship game, he only dropped back eight times. So. I, I think there's a an element of the 49ers offense of running the ball, running the ball, running the ball. And that's a lot by uh, necessity because, you know, I, I just don't know that he's the kind of quarterback. You just put it on, on his shoulders. I mean, Dan, frankly, at the end of the 2017 season, when he'd been with the team for just a couple of weeks and he stepped into the lineup and played some really good football and the 49ers had a bad team that year. They had only had one win up to that point. They ended up winning the final five games of the season that Jimmy Garoppolo 
is a heck of a lot like the Jimmy, Jimmy Garoppolo that we saw last year and even the healthy games this year. My, my point being that with Kyle Shanahan, he would expect his quarterback to go like Matt Ryan, you know, like good one year and then great the next. And that maturation, that improvement, we never saw from Jimmy Garoppolo. If I said to Kyle Shanahan, you can trade Jimmy Garoppolo straight up for Matt Ryan. I, I think that deal's made. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I'd even go so far as to say Kirk Cousins. I mean, uh, wow. Kyle likes Kirk Cousins. You know, Kyle yeah. had his mindset on Kirk Cousins uh, getting him as a free agent for the 2018 season. And then Bill Belichick basically gift wrapped uh, Garoppolo. And I mean, Jimmy's Jimmy's a good player. He had a good season last year. But he, he just he hasn't taken that next step. And, you know, some of it you can you can place on the injury issue this year, two different high ankle sprains. But but I just don't know that that he functions in Kyle Shanahan's offense the way Shanahan wants him to function. I know you're a, a pro football Hall of Fame voter. If Antonio Brown did not come back and play football. How would the the Hall of Fame selection committee view Antonio Brown's career? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, we, we certainly, I would look at it based on who he's up against. Uh, you know, you look at, there's so many guys out there. Um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider him a slam dunk, but I, I don't know that, you know, we would as a group, I, well, I should only speak for myself. I wouldn't look at any of the, the off the field stuff and the craziness that's happened over the past couple of years. He's a heck of a player, but you're not supposed heck. to factor that in. No, no, you're not. You, you could factor it in from the sense that he left a lot of football, you know, on his couch because he didn't make himself available to play because of off the field stuff. I think that that's an area, a little bit of a gray area there, but quitting on a team. I mean, there, it, I, I understand. And you guys have a tough job. I get it. But you know, like T.O. Uh -huh. Michael Irvin, you know, when you do things off the field that affects your team on the field, then I have to account for that. Yeah. And, and I think you could make that same argument with Antonio yeah. Brown, right? That, that he's done stuff that has affected teams. So, I mean, it's, it's down the road. Uh, I, I don't necessarily like to look at guys and, and say, oh, he's a, you know, he's a first ballot hall of famer. There are a couple of guys who are, but remember now we can only elect five modern era candidates every year. So unless you're Tom Brady, you know, or Aaron Rodgers, or you, you know, you name a, a is handful. Is JJ of guys. Watt a Hall of Famer today? I would think so. Yeah, okay. I would think so. Okay. I mean, I can't guarantee you he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Um, I, I think I was a little bit surprised. Not su yeah, a little bit surprised that say Jason Taylor and Brian Urlacher were first ballot Hall of Famers. But you know they got in. Uh, they they were going to get in eventually. I'm not saying that they weren't Hall of Famers, but when you start looking at that, I, I think where it's it's changed in recent years is that uh, there used to be this queue, right? Well, this guy's waited long yeah. enough. He's a Hall of Famer. <laughs> he deserves to get in, and and now it's just like you know plug him in, get him in there now. What's the craziest argument you ever heard? Oh, when you're in the room. You know what? I, I don't know that I've heard anything. It's pretty it's pretty straightforward. It doesn't get heated? Oh yeah, it gets heated. Dan, my first year on, I I made the case for uh Terrell Owens and it got heated. It got heated to the point that some of my friends were in that room were coming up to me afterward and like saying, Hey, sorry about that. <laughs> and so I'm like, <laughs> I don't you can't take it personally, but oh no, it, it, it gets heated, but it gets it last year. I don't think it got heated at all. It, it's kind of what you're talking about. It's those kind of polarizing candidates where people really take a stand one way or the other, but f through most of it, you can kind of, you know, last year, I don't know that there was any negativity in that room. It was just that, Hey, you know, this guy's great, but we like this guy better. I mean, th there was, I, I don't recall anyone just going after a candidate last year or even the last couple of years. So most of it is, is very positive because all the guys in that room were there for a reason. Julian Edelman. That's a tough one. I, I don't know. I, I think that that one, that one might take a while. I just don't know that he's had the, 
the, uh, you know, the, the, the career, the regular season career, the numbers. I mean, if you look at the postseason. But has somebody um, ever gone into the Hall of Fame and not been a Pro Bowl player? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. Would yeah, you so rather I, have Julian Edelman's career or Calvin Johnson? I don't know who made more money. Calvin Johnson did. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So did you take that. No, I mean, I, I think probably Calvin Johnson and he's up, uh, I believe this year he's, he's a, uh, he, a first ballot candidate yeah. uh, this year, but he's a tough one too, because you know, when you get into like, I, I, I thought Patrick Willis had a strong case to at least be in the top 15 mm. his first year. I mean, basically every year he played in the league, he was a, he was an all pro player. He was a pro bowl player. He didn't even make it into the top 15 his first year. So, you know, th then you start talking about Luke Keekley. you know, Luke Keekley and, and Patrick Willis, there's not a whole lot to, to separate those two. And I would put Calvin Johnson in that same category where for a short period of time, very, very dominant. And along those lines, Tony Baselli. I mean, Tony Baselli's shorter career is probably even than those guys, but you're talking about a premium position, left tackle. Those guys are hard to find. You know, it seems like more guards are in than tackles because guards can stay in that position and play and be in the Pro Bowl 12 years. Uh, a left tackle, th those guys are, are so difficult to find that if you can get a guy playing at a high, high level for four, five, six years, uh, you, you really have to consider him for the Hall of Fame. Philip Rivers? I think so. Yeah. I, I think eventually again, okay. you know, can't say first ballot, but I, I would say that there are so many guys and we could tick through. I, I was just thinking the other day about all the tight ends that are out there and, 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 you know, guys who are in that, that queue, right. Or guys who are going to be coming through there, but what's the, thing the toughest to position mind, though, five, Matt, when you look at as a voter, the toughest position to assess now with today's numbers and who is a hall of famer and who's not. Well, I do think wide receiver is getting more difficult. I think that the, the most difficult, I think, positions to assess are kind of the grunt work positions. You know, how do you, how do you grade a guard, you know, a center, a left tackle, a right tackle? Um, how about the defensive tackles? I mean, it's so much are, is put onto sacks if you're a defensive lineman. Well, you can definitely be a Hall of Fame player and not have 100 sacks. And so those are the positions where you, you can't you can't compare apples to apples. Uh, th that makes it difficult. Then when you start comparing different guys at different positions to those grunt work guys who you don't have a stat for, that that's where it becomes really difficult. Yeah, I figured running back because it used to be you got to 10,000 yards and you became a Hall of Famer. Uh, now, you know, we have these hybrids. I, I, I thought Fred Taylor might be a Hall of Famer. I thought Ricky Waters deserved to be in the Hall of Fame. Ricky Waters was sort of the forerunner to – what is today's running back now? He was a great pass catcher, ran for, you know, Tiki Barber on the cusp there as mm -hmm. well. But I, I don't know how to assess those numbers or how we'll assess those numbers at running back in the, uh, the coming years. Yeah, and of course, you know, I, I cover the 49ers, so people hear, you know, Roger Craig, you know, why yeah. isn't he in the Hall of Fame? Yeah. You know, he was he was a finalist with the Blue Ribbon Committee last year as they kind of expanded the Hall of Fame class. But, I mean, talking about a guy there that, that played fullback, played halfback, caught passes out of the backfield, and he was kind of the guy that enabled – Bill Walsh to do everything he wanted from that offense. So yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a, it's very difficult. Um, and, and I have my one vote and, and <laughs> you, you throw it in there and you see what comes out the other side. Uh, we appreciate you getting up and uh, sharing this information with us, Matt, have fun tonight. And uh, we hope to have you on again. Thank you very much. All right, Dan. I appreciate it. Thank you. Matt Mayoko. He's 49ers insider, NBC sports Bay area.